And um, I, I hope this is interesting because in part I feel like I'm just talking about an object or a set of objects that fascinate me and still trying to work out why they fascinate me and how I'm going to use them. So perhaps I ought to start by saying something more about um, my relationship to thinking about objects. I, I suppose I come from um, Marx and Lukács, the ideas of commodity fetishism and rarefication and that sense that Steve was describing of, I suppose, the object looming up as a big kind of <coughs> bogeyman um, in opposition to the subject, crushing um, the subject uh, down and our enslavement to this rhythm of production of, of the object, which is our sort of bad other, in a sense. But, you know, th through <coughs> those thoughts, I found my way to Walter Benjamin and haven't um, left him. And I think Benjamin does something very interesting that I suppose I've tried to assimilate into what I do, which is to take that notion of commodity fetishism, of the kind of uh, expansion of the object, which, you know, in Marx's theory is an object of exchange and an object of use. And it's only as an object of exchange, in a sense, that it, it becomes fetishized uh, for Marx. And um, so Benjamin takes this sort of sense of the, the, the presence of objects that have in a way a bad agency and that they command us to labor, to produce them. They command our worlds uh, into beings and, and structure them in quite difficult uh, ways for us or uneven and unequal ways for us. But Benjamin is simultaneously inspired by uh, surrealism and uh, by an interest in animation, which was something I came to discover in working on that. Um, and, um, and through surrealism and an interest in animation, in a sense, you get the enlivened object, the poetic object, the object as a sort of repository of human desires, human dreams, human wishes, and that, and that produces within Benjamin's writing a kind of affection for what the object represents. It becomes a, a, a dream-laden um, entity, and, and if we project our dreams and our wishes and our desires into the object, could we at a certain point say that the object, in a sense, has taken them over or has its own dreams and desires within it. And that's when you get this sort of uh, lively, um, uh, uh, active, animated sort of object worlds, which then led me to, to think about animation as a field and the object um, as animated object in, in, in a variety then of ways uh, as being a sort of image of a commodity fetishism that oppresses us but also uh, a, a, a potentially subversive or liberatory emancipatory uh, world of subjects and objects in co-communion um, co-creation of, of their environments um, so I think that's just a sort of position, a little bit of where I come from. And I've come to think, I suppose, more and more about sort of ma magical materials or enchanted materials. Um, you know, may maybe there's a kind of ambivalence here and an ambivalence that you'll see in, in the talk um, of whether objects really are enchanted or magical, or um, full of activity, you know, is, is not necessarily something that can be answered. And this was something I discarded, but perhaps I'll bring it back in here. Um, in looking around um, or researching the materials for, for this talk, I came across um, a letter, maybe this is very well known, from Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, to the Royal Society of London, which he wrote in 
December 1703, and I'm going to mention Leuvenhoek, which was one reason why I came across the letter. And he's a great microscopist, and he was looking at sand grains through a microscope and observes that no two sand grains are alike. He's looked at all these bits of sand, and he says in his letter, I formally affirmed of sand that you cannot find in any quantity whatsoever two particles thereof that are entirely like each other. And, and then he says they might in their first configuration have been alike, and thereby he means he believes that God created the world and created every sand grain, sand grain alike, but at present they're exceedingly different. And then he goes on to describe some of these sand grains. And the last one he describes, he also draws. And this is one of the things I'm interested in today, which is scientific representation. And in this one that he draws, he says, you may see in it a ruined temple, and in the corner of it two images of humane shape, kneeling and extending their arms to an altar that seems to stand at a little distance from them. So in this one tiny grain of sand, he's seeing this image which the sand itself has produced, subs well, may have been laid there by God, and this, I suppose, is the kind of ambivalence in it, may have been produced by the sand grain itself, or could just be a coincidence of the cracks and scrapes at that sand has experienced as an external force um, through time. So I just throw that in as a sort of image of a kind of ambivalence. And now I want to talk about my objects, perhaps in similar ways to Leuvenhoek, although without God as such. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me show you some examples of my objects, or rather images of them. I've got eight pictures. These are all the same class of objects. These objects, I find them hard to describe. I tried to make a description for something I was writing and I fall into languages of kitsch or uh, languages of art, so I might talk about some of them as cracked ice in pools of oil or rods with bubbles crowding round floating spikes or dense sequins in a pile up with black crosses at each centre or twisting lines of two-tone silk. Or I might say some of them are strangely like clay or like Klimt or like Van Gogh and some of them are sort of spidery dark globules with flecks of glitter dust or contour marks of maps with amoeba-like forms pressing in. They're very brightly coloured, and should you view them through a microscope, as one of their early observers said, they wear the hues of a changeable silk. But the images you have seen have all been viewed under polarised light, for these things uh, have a birefringent character. They scatter light in two directions, so if you shine two light in two different directions. At it, they come to resemble shattered rainbows or swirling seas of dye, or maybe uh, however you might describe these strange um, sort of little craft materials that are so ubiquitous these days, but I would you know, get them once a year from John <laughs> Lewis. My daughter gets them every day at a drop-in, you know, these wonderful twinkly, sparkly things. Um, so, so much for description. What about what they are, what they do? These threads and steps and terraces and planes and droplets do something. They bend light in various directions. They move. They meet and coalesce or copulate, form in new shapes and colours. They are, as the title of my lecture, of course, betrays liquid crystals. I think of them as little animated forms. Their molecules, which are tubular, are attracted to each other. But there are different forces of attraction on them, pulling in different directions. Now, when a substance, and I don't actually know what the originating substances of these different things are, but um, when the substance is cold, 
the forces that act on them hold the molecules quite still. So they will be a crystal. And what a crystal is, it's solid. It doesn't move, it doesn't deform, except for under certain conditions. Now, a crystal consists of layers of molecules. Those hold tightly together. But if you heat up a crystal, some of the weaker attracting forces in it are overpowered by the thermal motion of the heat. Others hold fast. The molecules scatter in different directions, but they remain on the same layer. So we can say it retains something of its crystalline structure, but the molecules slide around like sort of sliding platforms, I suppose, slipping over each other. So it becomes, the substance becomes partially liquid, but it retains crystal qualities, and that's what we call liquid crystallinity. If you keep the heat going, the molecules loosen all their bonds and bounce around randomly with no positional order or orientation, and that's when these things become fully liquid. So solid liquid gas. We know the phases of matter, and the liquid crystal state is one that interposes itself. It exists only for a few minutes on the way from hot to cold or cold to hot. If you would look at this same substance as liquid under a polarizing light, you would just see across polarizing light, you would just see blackness. But at the very moment when the liquid crystal state occurs, colors and shapes flash into view. Now, for me, in, in my wider sort of project, I suppose, this, this momentary phrase, someone compared it to Badiou's event the other day, but I had to think about that, is, um, is becoming an analogy for possibility, um, a, a sort of moment that, that you could catch then passes on. But I'm not going to talk about that now. I want to hold with how the liquid crystal comes to be an object and what sort of object it is or might be. So this momentary phase of liquid crystallinity was caught for the first time in the 1880s, which I have sort of realised is in, in terms of all sorts of other, particularly optical, cultural um, developments, a, a very key moment. So liquid crystals were observed as an anomaly, as these things so often are, in 1888 when a German botanist in Prague, uh, not this guy, but Friedrich Reinitzer, was experimenting with cholesterol from carrots, cholesterol benzoate, and he found that it had two melting points. And at the point, which is odd, and at the points of transition between the melting points, <coughs> colours flashed up. <coughs> he didn't know what to make of it and passed his results to a physicist, this man, Otto Lehmann, who was then in Aachen in Germany, who looked very closely at the substance through a polarising microscope and saw tiny crystals or crystallites in there. And it was he who concluded and began to write from this point onwards that what he saw was crystalline just as it was liquid and in an article in 1899 he named these strange occurrences flowing crystals though he did not yet understand them people laughed and mocked him this was impossible within the categories of science as then understood uh, an organic chemist called Ludwig Gatterman called them liquid crystals preferred that term Lehman took that term on and Gatterman begins to develop a vocabulary to describe their many appearances. So there's a sh streaky texture one gets, which he called the Schlieren texture, and some of you might <laughs> know about Schlieren photography as well, sort of shadow photography. Um, other words arise, smectic, nematic, chloristic, chiral. There's a whole world of description. In fact, one thing I came across now is the Lehman effect, uh, to the latterly um, uh, named... Uh, phase, which I have some pictures of later. Gatterman also saw how these crystals amalgamated and produced changing patterns, and he called this copulation. So growing and moving and conjoining, very much the early understanding of these objects was that they were alive in some sense, or as if alive. And that was the issue that concerned Otto Lehmann as he continued to study them until his death in 1922. And the titles of his books reflect this, his books and lectures. So there's a number of, of publications called Liquid Crystals and the Theories of Life from 1906, Apparently Living Crystals from 1907, and a film 
which is untraceable, which I wish I could find, from 1921, called Liquid Crystals and Their Apparent Life, which I imagine was some sort of animation. Um, to see life in a crystal form was not an aberration, as um, I'm sure many of you know. It was the case that chemists had long thought crystals may be some sort of lower life form. Many natural philosophers and scientists had observed that crystals grow, if nourished, and as they grow, they form themselves into shapes with facets and edges and, and curves. And it was observed that it was as if they intended to reach that form and that form alone. So a shattered crystal produces smaller versions of the original with similar flat surfaces or facets. Lehman, in one of his studies, cited a chemist from 1876 who spoke about <coughs> Selbsttätigkeit, self-activity in the crystal. I think contemporary scientific language calls it self-organisation or self-assembly. Lehman noted too that crystals have a stage of rapid growth in their, what he calls their youth and an adult phase in which they do not grow any bigger despite plentiful food supply. For further evidence of liquid crystals' lifelikeness, Lehman noted um, Moritz Ludwig Frankenheim's discussion of wounded crystals from 1860. The wounded part grows much more quickly and the original form reconstructs itself again so perfectly, not of course in terms of size, but certainly in terms of layering, that the process has been compared to reproduction in organic bodies and to the crystal has been ascribed an intuitive striving to amend itself. So all of these ideas, are they metaphors, are they descriptions, crystals heal themselves. They take in nourishment, they can be wounded and poisoned, they reproduce themselves. Now crystal life was something observable or something called crystal life. I mean, Lehman very often calls it apparent life. Indeed, Lehman reinforced his arguments by noting that some crystals look like organic life forms, for example, exhibiting pine cone-like characteristics. But he also voiced an objection to regarding crystals as a life form. Crystals are hard, whereas most organic, lively material, he says, is soft, like egg white. Here, his newly discovered matter, liquid crystals, with their fluid elements, staked a greater claim to be in the realm of the living. For Lehman, Liquid crystals seem to keep insisting on some relation to life. Um, he took Rudolf Virchow's 1854 study of human nerve fibres, and Virchow um, talked about this, the, the insulating sheath that forms around nerves and which allows the transmission of electrical impulses down them. Uh, Virchow called them my, uh, that myelin. Um, They'd been looked at by another scientist, von Mettenheimer, in a mo polarising microscope and saw that they exhibit this double refraction, this um, sending of light and receiving of light in two directions, as do crystals. Quinker's further experiments have produced an artificial form from soap and water and claimed that the core was solid crystal, but Lehman's identical experiments decreed them flowing crystals. There's been, there's been a book out recently called Soap, Flat Screen TVs and Science, I think, A History of Liquid Crystals, which is really, really great. And soap is a form of liquid crystal. So, so nerve fibres, the transmitters in a sense of, of vitality, of, of motion, were encased in liquid crystal. And so Lehman makes the assumption then that's more proof that liquid crystals have an, at least an affinity to life because they transmit life. But what is life? And this question vexed Lehman. And in his various writings, he returned again and again to the question of to what degree life is explicable by the laws of physics and chemistry and to what degree there's something else at work. Life, he notes, is the assimilation and dissimilation and self-regulation of all functions. But there are so many cases, he notes, which defy so simple a definition. What of a leaf that falls from a tree, lives for a while and then withers, 
At what moment did life leave it? Is Galvani's dead frog's leg alive when an electric current shoots through it? What of a heart that is cut from a body but which beats strongly at the point of rigor mortis when salt water flows through it? These instances act as if alive. And what of Robert Koch's seed kernels which continue to be viable even after a month in an evacuated glass tube? Or the microscopist Leuvenhoek's embryos remained in a state of suspended animation <coughs> for a year. So Lehman writes about these instances that hover between life and death. In all of his books, he keeps coming back to this quite unusually, maybe. For, he was something of a philosopher-scientist, which I think got him much um, mocked. Sheer movement can be elicited from the dead through electricity. The apparently dead can function as they function when living. Seemingly dead matter could yet bear new life. Now, Lehman wrote under the influence, which became reciprocal, of the biologist, the controversial biologist now, and even then, Ernst Haeckel, who, on hearing about liquid crystals in his 70th year, believed them to be the missing link between inorganic and living systems, and he devote, devoted his final work, Crystal Souls, to them in 1917. Now, Haeckel uh, is a very odd, very interesting figure um, in science and in some ways discredited now. Um, one, one of the uh, things he's most known for it is his his drawing abilities, his rendering, particularly of tiny sea organisms called radiolarians. Uh, he was on the HMS Challenger expedition where they plummeted to the deepest sea levels and brought back these microscopic creatures. And uh, Heckel um, devoted a lot of time to drawing these. So here's a few examples of some of his work. Um, they look so stylized, um, and and it's interesting. There's the oh, what's the name of the now? There, there's glass blowers from uh, Vienna. Forgotten their name now. They have some in the Grant Museum of Zoology. Most natural history museums have some. The Blachkas, uh blew glass into these forms. They're absolutely exquisite. Um, this is a page from Heckel's liquid, uh, uh, Crystal Souls book depict depicting liquid crystals. Um, one of the things I think that's always interesting is to ask, um, you know, how, how accurate, in a sense, are these? And um, these are, this is an actual contemporary scientific photograph of radiolaria, which, you know, I think show that there is an Art Nouveau styling, <laughs> you know, it's not so far from the peculiar symmetrical geometries and filigree of these uh, microscopic organisms. Now, my interest in some of this is as much about the envisaging Envisioning, oh gosh, envisioning of the objects that are discovered, these new objects or objects newly seen, uh, and the ways in which there were translations of objects, these new objects in a sense, or new to us objects, back and forth from science and art to become images in science and art and from art to science. And, you know, there, there are many ways in which these move around. So here, uh, some more of Heckel's drawings of um, microscopic categories of um, radiolaria and the like. <coughs> um, he writes 
a book, that some of these images appear in, in a book of illustrations that he puts out called Art Forms of Nature, so with the implication that nature itself is an artist sort of crafting and developing um, these extraordinary forms. And that book exerted much influence, this kind of aesthetic view of nature worked itself back out into art, as in the work of the designer René Binet, who then <laughs> designs this wonderful um, lighting um, uh, chandeliers and the like, sort of out of the designs from Heckel's underwater creatures. And uh, Binet also produced, based on Heckel's drawings, a cast iron entrance gate for the 1900 Paris Exposition. Now, Lehmann outlined Heckel's non-dualistic idea of life. Now, Heckel develops a whole religion or quasi-religion called monism in which he rejects the dualistic idea that there are mortal bodies and immortal souls. Heckel says instead there's just matter and it is all alive. Heckel's monism was footed on the idea of spontaneous generation. This is very much part of the debates of 19th century science, that organic life can arise from the inorganic realm through crystallization, just as Goethe had imagined in Faust when, his, when Faust's assistant Wagner creates a homunculus, a little man. <coughs> in the monistic view, as, as espoused by Heckel from the late 1870s, all matter is inhabited down to its atoms with what he calls sealer. Now, sila might mean soul. Um, this is something, actually, I got from the Alan Mackay piece that Steve directed me to. So Alan Mackay was a crystallographer here who uh, put out, translated and put out an edition of Crystal Souls, and it's got a fantastic uh, introduction, and he, he brings this out. Zela can equally mean psyche or mind or organising principles. It doesn't have to have necessarily the sort of... Uh, religious connotations that we might associate with um, soul <coughs> as a word. Sometimes, in fact, in the same context, Heckel wrote of Geist, mind or spirit. Uh, Hegel is uh, one of the part orders of the day. He writes the phenomenology of Geist, which has caused translators problems because you either read the phenomenology of mind or the phenomenology of spirit. So it's one of those curious German words. Um, Heckel quoted Goethe, matter cannot exist and be operative without spirit, nor spirit without matter. For Heckel then, what happens is that higher lo life forms are just combinations of lower ones. Everything has soul, but more complex organisms just have more of it. And so they have more of this capacity, it's like an electrical force or something, more capacity to organise themselves, to have more life about them, in a sense. To clarify Heckel's point, Lehman suggested an analogy between life forms and socio-political states. So the state is a combination of many individuals. In combination, through working together and through the division of labour, the more complex entity, the state, possesses increased facility compared to the individual. But life is in every part of it. Atoms, says Heckel, possess atomic souls. And it's the interactions between these souls that produces life. The more interactions, the greater the complexity of the life. Death is not the moment when the soul splits from the body, but rather the dissolution of the whole into individual parts of a lower order which no longer interact with each other. There are fewer lines of communication or they are cut. The question returns then, is the crystal a living being? Its atoms strive to amalgamate, but is this akin to the way that humans aggregate to form associations? This was the question for Heckel and for Lehman. Now Heckel was a strong proponent of the idea of the crystal as a lower life form. Lehman only went so far as to say that there are analogies the liquid crystal exhibits apparent life, and yet it, at the very least, allows us to specify more about where life itself begins, or to put it in the 
most ambivalent way, perhaps matter shows itself to be, at the very least, haunted by something called life. <coughs> now, those debates are long, and I think they evoke something around th the debates that we've addressed today, and maybe, maybe even developments in speculative realism and that whole end of things about whether objects have a world for themselves and um, whether we can know the subjectivity of objects, um, questions of object memory, and, and so on. I just want to stick with the optical apprehension of the object for a moment. Now, under the microscope, Lehman had seen mobile fluid droplets with complex and changing structures. What he saw in them required a new vocabulary, uh, which certainly has been mocked by past and present scientists. So he talks about how, through the discovery of liquid crystals, a quite new force has been found, molecular directive force, what he calls Richtkraft, whose existence could not have been concluded from the facts known until now. Elsewhere, he gave it a different name, Gestaltungskraft, formational agency. But, and Gestalt has further resonances. Gestalt evoked a natural scientific tradition, which we might call a Germanic one, that went back to Daniel Sennett's atomism, which arose on the cusp of Aristotelian medieval scholasticism and modern science. For Sennett, the atom is a chemical entity, but it does not randomly congregate with others simply according to mechanical laws. Rather, it's driven to bond with others by another non-material shaping, this power of forming. Now, those involved in early crystallography found Sennett's version of atomism seductive. It placed an emphasis on form, the atoms shape the forms that they comprise as if they were completing an architect's plan and the forms that crystals make refer back to what were understood to be the primary geometric forms of creation, the five platonic forms as depicted by Leonardo da Vinci here that were ideal crystals names I find hard to say, the tetrahedron, hexahedron, or cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, and icosahedron. Goethe's morphology flowed into this tradition, for it emphasised the exploration of external and internal appearance, the shape, colour, structure, and pattern of things. It's this whole tradition of looking, which is very prominent in this line of science. Lehman too emerges from a tradition of looking, of morphology, I suppose, of looking at li liquid crystals and observing them rather than asking about their functions. It's just four images showing what is now called the Lehman effect, um, which is something about the, the ways in which particular crystals turn and move. The liquid crystals that Lehman saw formed buds like pseudopods and chains like snaky bacteria, he said. Inside the droplets, he perceived something like the nuclei. The droplets sometimes coalesce, this he saw. As in nature, he noted, this coagulation sometimes produced bizarre misformations or crossbreeds. Liquid crystals, then, were an animated form, not in the sense of being impelled into motion by an external, invisible force. Rather, they were animate in the sense that they displayed animation through their inherent propensity to evolve, grow, self-actualize, and express vital signs. There's something romantic about this. Romantic natural science had always proposed this power of forming, the organicism of the whole, and the value of looking. The science of looking, uh, expressed in Goethe's words by the idea of tender empiricism. Goethe writes about tender empiricism 
or a line, a much quoted line um, in his Maxims and Reflections, where he says the following. There is a delicate empiricism that makes itself utterly identical with the object, thereby becoming true theory. But this enhancement of our mental powers belongs to a highly evolved age. It's one thing that he says in a sense that if you look, you look so much that you sort of meld yourself with what you are looking at and it becomes thought, I suppose, through this process of looking where it becomes cognition. And this other line from Maxims and Reflections, every new object, well contemplated, creates an organ of perception in us, which I think is a very um, interesting line, interesting idea, which I think Walter Benjamin, for one, takes up, takes very seriously. In, uh, in his small history of photography, Benjamin investigates uh, August Sander's social typological images, um, which Sander makes in the 20s when he wants... He makes a, a, a book called The sort of Face of Humanity, many, many images of every type of person in German society in the 20s. Um, and... You could see it almost as a botanical exercise or a scientific exercise in sort of genus and class and species and type. And what he's trying to do is to take the most typical image of each um, possible mode of being in, in Weimar, Germany. Um, so Benjamin says these are gleaned from direct observation and he cites the Goethe line in, in relation to them. There's a delicate empiricism that makes itself utterly identical with the object, thereby <coughs> becoming true theory. So Sanders' image of a cook or a um, confectioner, his image of a hod carrier, and of uh, someone, the trapeze artist, someone who works at the circus. The notion of, of an object creating an organ of perception in us is an intriguing one. In seeing, through the process of seeing itself, through looking at the new object, we augment our own mode of seeing. We, in a sense, see seeing itself in order to see the newly seen. And in this process of reciprocity, our mode of seeing is, is changed. I think there's a technologically determined version of this, which is expressed in Benjamin, where, for example, the camera, the photographic camera, or the film camera becomes a kind of prothesis, becomes part of our organ of perception, and through it um, we see the world, the new world, in new ways. So in the um, work of art essay and elsewhere, and he talks about the ways in which the camera shatters um, this banal world within which we moved, so shatters it into ruins, within which we can take um, adventurous travels. It sort of reproduces the world for us anew. It produces uh, a lot of possibility through that process because it's, it's effectively an assault on natural um, physics and natural law, in a sense. But it's about, uh, he says it, we then reassemble it according to new laws, although I think they remain potential. There's something image to us in film that is presented as a potential for a reordering then in the extension uh, into the worlds in which we live. Um, the way I'm discussing things here, I think the microscope too, similarly, is an organ that's producing... <coughs> or that is an instrument that's producing a new organ of perception for us. In any case, in liquid crystals, the, phys the physicist Otto Lehmann, who discovered them, says they couldn't have been discovered by physics because their properties did not tally with the theory of the time. It wasn't physics that found them, it was the microscope, he says. And, in fact, uh, Lehman was famous then for inventing... Uh, he had to, to see them, he had to invent a new microscope that 
included a, a hot plate on it so that he could heat them while looking at them to catch that stage. Um, and then he added a camera to it so he could photograph it. He took black and white images um, from the turn of the century onwards, which are included in, um, in some of in the books, where well, they're always included, but there, there's one book where his assistant had to then sit there colouring them all in, which I find uh, quite remarkable. Beautifully coloured little things, which is probably the case with, with the, the Heckel coloured liquid crystals too. So liquid crystals are found by the microscope. They come as a visioned object, as a confection in a sense of polarised light or of light interference interacting with chemical substance. Um, and that's that sort of sense of there and not there. Ooh, I can talk quite a long time, can't I? <laughs> um, <laughs> OK, so maybe I'll, I'll leave out some rather horrible Nazi stuff, because <laughs> some of this all goes a bit horrible. Um, and German science and gestalt and German molecules and awful things happen. Not Lehman, he's dead by 22, but um, some of these people go on to rather curious uh, organicist ideologies. Um, my interest in these forms and it expands onwards. And I just wanted to say a few, few words about that just to, to contextualise the, the project because... You know, liquid crystals were found. It, they're an object. They're a state of matter. They're, they're found, in a sense, at a certain point, although they've always been there. Uh, that's how, why they can be found. Um, but nobody knew what to do with them. And in a sense, that's that notion of, of looking. They were seen, and we've seen them, and we described them, and we photographed them, and but nobody knew what to do with them. They couldn't apply them. But in time, and this... You know, it's the continuation of the story. They turn from something that's vision, something that's seen, to becoming part of the matter of vision. And Lehman had almost imagined this because he, he saw them pointing into the future. In 1904, he speculated on the possibilities of how such a mixture of soft and semi-liquid substance, um, um, or what he called soft machines, might join up with the forces that accompany electrical phenomena from what he called, or others called, the, the physik des ethers, the physics of the ether, uh, which for him included the forces of moving electrons, such as the curious, then curious cathode ray, as well as the new and then still enigmatic rays that emanate from radioactive substances. Now, in time, by the 1960s, scientists discover electro-optic characteristics of liquid crystals and um, it's from that point onwards that the liquid crystal display screen begins to be developed, first of all. You're all too young to remember it, probably, but, you know, when calculators came and they had <laughs> these little things you could see, and then um, early, um, uh, early computers uh, onto these beauties uh, that we know today. This is just some of the current advertisers. Th these are adverts. These ones are all advertising the new 3D LCD. Ah, super intense realities we can find. I mean, for me, um, I mean, on, on the, the flatness of the screen through the power of electricity, just as Lehman had sort of predicted in a sense, liquid crystals now dance in ever more animate and colourful forms. Now, I'm interested in the space and time proposed by these new liquid crystal machines, or not so new now, and how much it emerges out of liquid crystallinity itself. Because you know, These screens could be developed because of particular characteristics of liquid crystals and what that made of the screen, which means you, know, you no longer have the, the, um, the televisual um, mode of, of presentation, of um, scanning and so on, but this pix pixelation... You measure the speed of a liquid, or you measure the value of a liquid crystal screen through the speed in which it takes to move from light to dark, switching on and off pixels. And this is how you're activating liquid crystals to go on and then to go off. To go on. Um, so it's a, it's a different mode of conveying the image. And um, I've been thinking about the, the specificities of that, which for me take up these characteristics of the liquid and the crystal and 
um, you know, the fact that these screens are said to produce flowing movement, they have a liquid sense about them, and they can freeze the crystallinity, you can freeze them without, the, so they, they flow without ghosting and trace, as old, unlike old TV and video technology, and they can be arrested and frozen uh, at a moment without blur. So it's that liquid crystallinity that's an inherent property of the screen. And I'm thinking about ways in which then they um, produce a visioning of through this other nature that's discovered of nature um, in other forms. And this all relates back again to Benjamin and his idea of an under natur, different nature or other nature and in and Eisenstein's notion of non indifferent nature, uh, which is all about nature conceived in motion and so on. This is all probably a bit garbled, but I'm just trying to give you a, a window onto how, for me, I suppose, the, the, the description and understanding of the properties of the object, which is the, the smallest part which congregates together into <coughs> a larger version, which is the liquid crystal display screen produces its own aesthetic and also, dare I say, a politics of visioning. And, you know, part of this is, for me, is the interest in how liquid crystal is both the matter of the screen, you know, it's what the screen is made of, but also the subject matter on the screen. Um, uh, and so the propensity... Um, in, in our epoch of viewing, which is heavily dominated by um, computer-generated imagery, <coughs> which relies on liquid crystallinity in various ways, the propensity to show, to model natural behaviours in the form of disaster, ecological disaster movies, floods, ice ups, seas, mountains. Um, so a new kind of liquid crystal sublime is what... I've been um, thinking about and the ways in which the screens are the sort of perfect site for that to be displayed, unfold, both created, they're at both ends, both created through computer-generated animation and displayed uh, increasingly within the home in these uh, 3D versions. Um, so perhaps that's where I'll end, just with a sort of window onto that window in, in a way, but I hope that gives some sense of maybe not very self theorized sense, but practical demonstration of taking an object and sort of extending it through. Anyway, so, thank you. Thank you.